Give me the hot sauce, fans. You, we got a very special show planned for you today. You know that Stacy always brings the best guests to you each and every week. And today we have the Zen Master himself, Stacy's old coach, Phil Jackson, is going to join us to talk about his long run with the Bulls, the Lakers, his take on the current NBA. So keep it right here. We're going to have an extended interview with Phil Jackson coming up. He doesn't do many of these, Stacy. It's fantastic to have him join us today. Yeah, you know what? I had to go all the way up to the, the mountains of Montana <laughs> to find him, you know, and I had to fight a couple of grizzly bears. That's right. Mountain lions. Uh, and I found him. There you go. He was he was fly fishing. <laughs> he was fly fishing with no shirt on. I caught him. So he's coming down. He's coming out the mountain, baby. He's coming out the mountain to come down here to give me the hot sauce. We get the best guest. Woo! A lot of great basketball talk coming up, but first we uh, want to check in with our good friend uh, Tim Kelly, who wasn't with us last week. You were uh, in Vegas. Uh, tell us about that. I had to go to a wedding out there. I Any great some, stories, uh, or is this a, whatever happens in Vegas stays in well, Vegas? Well, there is that, except for herpes, of course. But oh, <laughs> there you go. Oh man, damn, damn, damn! <laughs> no, but I did go see Bill Burr, and my face still oh, hurts. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He absolutely destroys. It was funny though. Everyone had to give their uh, camera or their phone up uh, to walk in there. Is that right? Yeah, I haven't. I've no never bootleg had videos. Happen. Yeah, no, no. No, dice. they do that. They did that with uh, Kevin Hart when he came to United Center. They took yeah. their phones. They put him. They put him in like some kind of like a bag yeah, sealed bag that you can't like, open. You can't <laughs> open until they get wow. the very end. When yeah. you walk out, they got to undo it. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty it's, cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Made sure you didn't take no pictures. Right. And, and Whisper celebrated a birthday yesterday, right? That's right. Wow. How old are you now? Uh, you don't have to share that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was one that didn't feel good. I'll put I'm it that way. You, you know that uh, your niece Maddie is, is is bouncing back from mono. Otherwise, she'd have a cake for you. No, uh, she's bouncing back from something else. I think. Oh. What's that? <laughs> <A> hangover. Oh. <laughs> what celebrating oh. your birthday? That's right. Wow. Yeah, we a we, wild we, Wednesday night in the Kelly compound. Oh, yeah. oh you had a party. Yeah, no, no, Stacey, we didn't get our invitation. Now Damn. you find out who your friends are, right? <laughs> oh, my God. A live show. Hold it, hold it, hold it. For real? <laughs> no, we didn't have a party. You had a party? No, we did not. Yeah. No, Maddie's no, nodding her head. Big party. Yeah. See, oh, no, see, we went America, out to dinner. America, America. America. This is why, this is what I'm talking about right here. See, the guy The guy always forgets his people. We, yeah. We've been boys for over 30 years. You know, only time he ever asked me to do something when he wants me to serve hors d'oeuvres. He says, hey, you want to get on the boat, Stacy? Oh, sure, I'm going to go up to uh, Lake Geneva. I'm yeah, going to ride yeah. the boat, sit out there in the sun, put my sunscreen on. He goes, no, no, there won't be none of that. No. You, you'll be working. Well, I mean, working. that what nice tuxedo t-shirt. Yeah, 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 I'm thinking yeah. more Isaac of the love boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants me to wear a tuxedo with white gloves and, and have a little white handkerchief and serve hors d'oeuvres to people. Wow. Well, well, if Maddie play Julie, it works out well. Wow. You know what? This is real low, America. You know what? It's a new, new low. Happy birthday. You know, happy birthday and go to hell. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. That's, that's how your, we roll here. That's your give present me the right sauce. there. Yeah. Go to well, hell. You don't invite me and Mark? Okay. 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 Well, there's always next year. No, there won't be next year for you. Yeah, this well, might be your those, last show. After those warm <laughs> feelings shared here on Give Me the Hot Sauce, we might as well talk a little basketball. Let's start out here in Chicago. Alex Caruso woke up yesterday to a nice honor, finding he was named to the first team all-defensive squad. And when you think about that, Stacey, Caruso didn't start every game. His minutes, you know, not as, as high as others. But that tells you something about what kind of impact he made on coaches and media to be voted first team all-defense. Well, I tell you what, he's well-respected in the NBA. I mean, guys know that he is a very good defensive player, whether it's on ball, whether it's help. Uh, he missed some games with injuries. I, I thought, you know, I thought he was a first teamer, mm -hmm. but I thought that they would end up making him a second teamer because based off the Bulls record, they always don't want, they never want to reward guys on, on you know, teams that are underachieving or didn't do well. Um, so I thought that would hurt him per se. Uh, but shows the respect of, of the national guys and the media people who vote for that, uh, that they respect him. Because I'm telling you, that every night that kid brings it. Every single night he brings it. doesn't matter if he's guarding a big, small. He's helping. He's talking. When he's out of the lineup, the Bulls defense goes down big time. They go from being a top five defensive team to like 15 to 20 uh, mm -hmm. rated team. When he's in there, and when both him and Lonzo were in there last year, I'm telling you right now, the Bulls' defense was in, you know, just you couldn't do nothing with it when those two guys were out there. 
The All-NBA teams were also announced this week, and I don't think there were any big surprises there. You have to do it by positions, so you couldn't have uh, Jokic and Joel Embiid on the first team. But next year, they're changing that. It's going to be positionless, so it'll be interesting to see how the voting goes. But it kind of went according to form, I think. You know, LeBron was on the third team. He missed a lot of games this year, and and Kevin Durant didn't make any of the teams, again, because he missed too many games. Ooh. (laughs) <laughs> Kevin Durant maybe the best player in the world but he didn't make yeah, one of the three all NBA teams you know I mean listen I mean he, he missed some games but yeah. I, I don't think he missed you know more than half the season I mean he's still arguably the, a, a top five player in the league and, yeah John you know, Morant didn't make any of the teams either oh I, well I'll tell you what, he left 39 million dollars on the oh, table I'll too tell you because what, yeah. that was in his contract if he made one of those teams whether right. it be first second or third he had a 39 million kick in and that would have put him up in that that Derrick Rose contract after his you know yeah. he's out playing yeah. his rookie year he'd have been I think 230 something million dollars he would have made now he's going to make 193 so it's, he's not hurting still but that 230 <laughs> something woo one of the guys celebrating, Stacy mentioned about the clauses in the contract. Jalen Brown made second team All NBA, and that triggered the possibility of a five year extension. I think it's like two hundred fifty million. He he get he got a bonus of like fifty sixty million by making one of those teams. He deserves it. He deserves yeah. it because he's been very consistent all year round uh, with his offense, his defense. He's a he's a very good two way player. Uh, you see Jimmy buckets there. You see Steph Curry. Jokic, I mean, those that's tough because all those guys easily could be on the first team. Yeah. I mean, Jay Gildress Alexander made a first team guard, which was a bit of a surprise at a small market, but he had fantastic stats all year long. Show, show me the first team. Yeah, uh, Shea Gildress was, I, was Shea on. Gildress the first yeah, team? With uh, Giannis and Bede. There you go. Okay. Luka Doncic okay. and Jason I, Tatum. I, I can't argue with that, but I, I will say this. I mean, and I like Shea Gildress Alexander. Um, you easily could have, you know, you could have put him down. But again, I understand they're going by positions, you know, guard, forwards, you know. Um, I, I would have, I don't know, I would have put, oof, that's tough. Yeah, Jayla I mean, you Brown consider guys that there. didn't make it, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, who, who didn't make it besides, uh, I mean. Well, yeah, Durant, Durant and Ja. Ja Morant. And Those are probably the two guys that you they really stand out as, as well, big names in the team. sport. Go to that second team. Let me see that second team. See, I, I would have yeah, yeah, Donovan, Donovan Mitchell easily could have been up there for what he did with Cleveland. Mm-hmm. I mean, he easily could have been a first team. Uh, Jimmy Butler, I think he gets penalized a lot because he misses games during the season. Um, but he easily could be. If you if you were basing off the playoff, he'd be a first teamer. And third team, you got that too. Damian Lillard, uh, I know, was on there. And oh, see, okay, okay, I didn't even oh see Anthony Davis. Team. Anthony Davis didn't make any of the teams either because, again, he missed a lot of games. Yeah, see, I'm telling you. See, Dame Lillard easily could have been a first team or two. Right. You know, he easily could have been a first team. Yeah, right? he had uh, just a uh, fantastic year yeah, in terms of scoring. Yeah. He really carried that team. But yeah. I think the way Portland started tanking at the end of the year and, and Lillard didn't play the last 10 or 15 games because they knew that, you know, he was not uh, – they just wanted to okay. tank as, as much as they could. All Sabonis right. got the third-team center. So, you mentioned Sabonis LeBron, and Julius Sabonis, Randle. Sabonis and, and you know, uh, the point guard De'Aaron Fox. That's – I give you that. Uh, Randall's third team. Jalen Brunson should easily right, be on he there, didn't too. Either, yeah. Jalen Brunson should have been on one He's of those He's carrying teams. that Knicks team. Yeah, yeah. He, he should definitely be. I, I, w- I definitely would have, um, because you're not doing positionless and you have to go by, I, I mean, that's a toss-up between De'Aaron Fox and, and Jalen Brunson. Right. Because I know that it's a surprise to the Kings and how well they played this year, but you could say the same thing for the Knicks. The Knicks were not in the playoffs last year. And this kid took them all the way out, and I mean they're on the verge right now. It's this three to was it three two Miami? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They'll go for the clincher tomorrow. The clin- yeah, they'll go for the clincher tomorrow. But he easily could have been on that third team. I'm surprised. About How about that. Booker? Ooh. Yeah, another name, another big name left Ooh. off. Right? Booker's not on none of those teams. Yeah, I would think Booker is a top ten player in the oh, league right now. Oh, yeah. I'm telling. I mean, who makes who makes this list? It's media voting. Okay, see that's why the media should not. If you're in the media. You, you had to play the game. You should get anybody in the media that played like Kenny Smith, you know, those guys, you know, those guys should vote on who should be on the all NBA team because to not have Booker on there and Booker didn't miss games. Booker didn't miss like 60 games or something. Booker all year round was arguably the best two guard in the league. I mean, I, I that's oof, not to make the, not even to make the second or third team. Ooh. I just saw something on Twitter that uh, they found out that Mark Jackson, you know, the former coach, former player, now commentator on ABC, did not have Nikola Jokic on his MVP ballot. 
<laughs> puff, puff, pass. So, so it's Jackson. not only the media that sometimes hey, makes some crazy hey, he spent too much decisions. time in Denver, Colorado, baby. Man down, hand down. <laughs> that's, that's insane. I know. How that could you not insane. have Jokic on your MVP he was, ballot? He's a top three player in the MVP right. voting. How are you not going to have him on any team? I know. Wow. Absolutely. See, now, now, see, now, now that, just, that just shoots my theory in the foot. <laughs> right. Having a former player. I right. just, I Who just, should know better. I just, I just advocated for having players who were in the media vote. Now yeah. I'm taking that back <laughs> because of Mark Jackson. So disregard what I said, America. I, I, oh, man, damn. Well, let's talk about the uh, current playoff series right now. None of them ended. We thought a couple might end yesterday, but the Knicks came up with a good effort. Again, Jalen Brunson, 38 points, leading them to a victory at MSG. And then the Golden State Warriors dug deep, and uh, they found a way to win. I thought Golden State came up with a different strategy. You know, they had Draymond Green actually going to the basket and trying to be offensive-minded. That really kind of, I think, put the Lakers on their heels a little bit. Listen, because, you know, Jordan Poole is struggling. Yeah. And I, I'm expecting Jordan Poole this next game to explode. It, he's just due. He's just due. I mean, he's, for whatever reason, he hasn't had the year that he had last year, and he hasn't shot the ball as good as he's capable of shooting. I just think he's due for a good game, and I think it's one of those games where he t- they tied up on the road and come back home to Golden State in seven games. And you like think they, they win it, Warriors? I think they do. Yeah. Um, it's 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 Anthony Davis. I tell you what, Anthony Davis, one minute looks like the best player on the floor, and then there's a game off, and then I look like the best player on the floor, and then there's another game off. He has to have be more consistent. I think they were sitting there waiting for Lonnie Walker Jr. to have one of those magical fourth quarters. Yeah, and he didn't do it on the no, road. He didn't. No, he didn't do it. He had four points in that game last night. Um, and I think Golden State, they've had their chances. They, You know, listen, no one ever criticizes their shot selection because they make all these crazy three-point shots. But you sometimes have to question their shot selection because sometimes the, sh- the shots they're taking – those are shots are okay during the regular season, but in the playoffs, when you're you're facing a team that is is got the ability to to uh, make you you know basically kick you out of the playoffs, knock you out. Why are you taking these half court three point shots? It's not a time to do that. Well, in Game Four in L.A., Anthony Davis got switched on to Curry and did a great job of staying in front of him, and Steph just put up two just prayer kind of shots in a both, two point game. Both both Clay Thompson and Steph Curry have taken some questions. I saw someone ask uh, Steve Kerr that in the presser, and uh, he said, "Hey, look, you know, I, I'm gonna live with those shots. Right, these guys have right. hit those shots their whole career, and I get that. I get that because it's something they've done. But they've got to understand when you're down two. <laughs> you're down one. You can't be taking those kill shots. You're trying to go for the kill instead of just being thinking basketball a little bit better. Like, hey, we're down two. It's a one possession game. We can tie it up and keep this game going. Or if they're down one, we got a chance to go, you know, get to the basket, get a foul, win the game that way. But, whoo, man, I, 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 they've got to take better shots because – also, that limits their 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 uh, rebounding, offensive rebounding, because no one's really in position to get offensive rebounds. Lakers get those boards. They come back down. They're pushing it. There's mismatches all over the floor. And that's where when the Lakers have won, that's when the Lakers take advantage of those switches. The other game five that was played on Wednesday night uh, in Madison Square Garden, the Knicks found a way to beat Jimmy Butler in the Miami Heat. The Heat were one of the worst three-point shooting teams throughout the entire regular season in the playoffs. They've been red hot. Guys like Gabe Vincent and Max Struess and Duncan Robinson and and, uh, Caleb Martin. All of a sudden, these guys are are raining in three-point shots. Max Struess was with us. I know. He was with us. <laughs> they found, listen, they dusted off. Local Dun- guy. They, they dusted off Duncan Robinson, too. Yeah, he made they some realize, shots. They realize that three-point shooting is, is very important. Listen, Miami has always been historically a very good three-point shooting team. This year is one of those aberrations mm-hmm. where they didn't shoot the ball very well. Um, you got Tyler Hero out. Uh, but they have picked the right time to knock down shots. And when you got a guy like Jimmy – Jimmy demands so much attention. And when you see Jimmy with the basketball, every New York Knicks player is is locked in to help double, triple, get the ball out of his hands. And and Tibbs' philosophy is someone else is going to beat us. You're not going to beat us. You've had some great games. I'm a believer. I know what you can do. We're going to take the ball out your hands, and we can live with Caleb Martin knocking shots, Kevin Love taking three-point shots, you know, uh, Duncan Robinson taking shots, Struess. We'll live with those shots because, you know, Miami's had some up and down this series where they've hit a lot of threes, and then they didn't hit threes, and he's playing the percentages. 
We'll talk about the two Game 5s coming up to our Game 6 is coming up tonight in just a second. But first, we want to tell you about one of our great sponsors, our good buddy Jeff Vukovic. When it comes to insurance for your auto, home, and business, make sure you contact the king of insurance, our good friend, nationwide agent Jeff Vukovic. You can reach him at jeffvuk.com. That's jeffvuk.com. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see all his information on the screen. Make sure you contact him for all your insurance needs, auto, home, and business. And as always, the best jingle in the business featuring our good friend Stacey King. Nationwide is on your side. <laughs> very nice, very nice on a Thursday evening. As we roll on, as we look ahead at some game sixes, potential closeout games, Phoenix is at home. They have to win to keep their series alive against the Denver Nuggets. And this one has been interesting, Stacey, because it, you know whoever's at home seems to see, have a lot of confidence, and the road team struggles a little bit. Well, it's been that way. Yeah. Um, I, I think the key for, for Denver is to take care of the basketball, number one, because they've turned the ball over in Phoenix a lot. And when they play at home, for some reason, they don't turn it over. They're going to have to have a big game out of Jamal Murray if they're going to win. Uh, Aaron Gordon is going to have to play out of his mind because Phoenix, for some reason, looks like a totally different team at home than they do on the road. Um, DeAndre Ayton going to have to play big. He's going to have to give them something because you got to have to find a third score. You know, Chris Paul being out again, hurts them tremendously because they have to rely so much on Booker and Durant to score and they don't have a third guy. There hasn't been a consistent third guy where where Chris Paul would be that consistent third guy getting you 15, you know, 10 assists, a couple of rebounds from the point guard spot. So that's really hurt them. So they got to find someone tonight that can take some pressure off those guys. And Landry Shamit was great in game four in Phoenix, but then he goes to Denver and doesn't shoot the ball well. And then they've got a couple of vets in T.J. Warren and Terrence Ross, who they're using on the bench now, but they were not productive in that Game 5 loss in Denver. No, because sometimes the moment is too bright for certain guys. You know, this is a very tough series because, you know, in the back of your mind, if you're some of these players who are not counted on during the regular season, you know, it creeps into your mind like, hey, you know, every game's important. You know, um, you know, this is for a trip to the Western Conference Finals. Whoever wins this game, you know, is probably looking at being the favorite to go to the finals. Yeah. So uh, there's some pressure. I mean, TJ Warren uh, is really surprising because he was a big time scorer for Indiana. He hasn't been the same since he came back from injury. Uh, when he was in Brooklyn, you know, you know, he didn't have a role and he doesn't have a role on this team. So yeah. um, it, it's, it's, they're going to have to find someone. This is where like Mikhail Bridges was big for them. And they had a, a little bit more depth before they went Cam out. And Johnson. Got, yeah, they went out and got some. They went out and had depth when they had those guys. But when you traded for Kevin Durant, you gave up all that depth. Right. And they haven't been able to recover from that. So you think Denver wins that series? Yeah, I say it all alone. Denver's got to be the favorite. Uh, I, I mean, the way they play, and and you know when Jokic decides that he's going to be the best player on the floor. There's nothing you can do about that. I mean, they shoot the ball extremely well. Murray's got his legs underneath them. Um, they're very deep, and they're talented. They really get after him. I mean, Bruce Brown does all the little things that you want a guy to do that you don't have to run plays for. Game six tonight in Philadelphia. The 76ers Ooh. have a chance to close out the Celtics, who were presumed to be going to the finals once Milwaukee got knocked out of the opening round. And they looked terrible in game five at home. Their fans were booing them. They are down 20 in the second half. What well, do you expect anything else different from the Boston Celtics fans? I'm, I'm sorry. They, they'll turn on you, man. They'll turn on you. But listen, Joe Missoula, listen to me, man. I, I know, you, you know you don't know me from a can of paint, okay? I think you do know me. If you look it up, you know, you know me. <laughs> but, but the adjustments that he has made in this series has to be questioned. He's even come out and really called himself out, you know, saying that he should have made a sub here, should have done that. Would have, could have, should have. You need to do it. You know, and then they act like Joel and B just fell out of the ceiling. Yeah. Like he, Where'd he like, come he, from? Like he just so showed up and, you know, in the last game. Yeah. You knew he was going to play. You should have had a game plan. We're not, he's not going to be in game one. That's fine. We'll play without him there. But we have to have a game plan when this guy comes back because he has to be accounted for. He's too big. He's too strong. He, he makes everyone around him better. He's decided to play defense. He's blocking shots. He's doing a great job rim protection. Robert Williams should have been out on the floor. And he's now, starting in game six now. Now, now, because somebody <laughs> from the front office probably yeah. said, hey, yeah. look, look, 
this kid was big for us last year when we made yeah. our run. And he's a he's a rim protector, and he can at least present some problems for Embiid a little bit with his size. You know, you're asking Grant Williams to guard Embiid. That's a mismatch. You're, yeah. You know, Jalen Brown. These guys can never Marcus guard Smart's him. been guarding Mar him a lot of times switches. I mean, yeah, because Marcus Smart is a guy that will – flop and try to take charges but Embiid is too smart for that yeah. Embiid's just not going to overpower a guy like that he's just going to just he's going to get the ball low turn around and shoot it over a six foot two guard come on now you're not going to run him over yeah. so now here comes Robert Williams and I think they're going to start Al Horford so now you got rebounding and all this I think Boston goes in and wins I do I think Boston goes in and wins because they 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 have the type of team that can go in there when the chips are down they yeah. can win J Jason Tatum can get hot uh, Jalen Brown, those two guys got to come in. They got to put up 25 or more. That third person who comes up, Marcus Smart's got to play big for him. Derek White's got to play big. If they can get those guys in there and then keep, you know, Philadelphia out the paint where they are so good at the drive and kick. These guys are knocking down threes. Maxie's hitting shots. When they're making shots, boy, Philly's tough to beat. How about James Harden turning back the clock in a couple of those games? Two forty point pepper games, wings, baby. <laughs> lemon pepper wings, baby. Do it to you every time. I know I feel good. I think it's some lemon pepper wings. He went to Vegas, and I tell you what, that could have backfired because he had the big forty five point game after coming back. From yeah. Vegas. Then he had a, a, a goose egg the next time. A couple of bad and then ones. People yeah. started talking about the the Vegas trip, and then he had another forty point game. They yeah. said, "I'll leave that man alone. Let him eat his lemon pepper wings." Yeah. So he's got to play well too. If he if James Harden plays like an all-star, you know, which he is, it, it, they got a chance to go really, really deep. Felt bad for our guy, Michael Wilbon. Before uh, game four, he says just before they go to the game broadcast, he goes, there is no way James Harden is going to have another 40-point game in this series. He, he took it like a man, though. He went on PTI and said, yeah, I was wrong. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't think Harden had yeah, another game like that in that's that. Listen, when you got a guy who's a former MVP and he still can play at a high level, you don't say things like that. You don't. Yeah, you, you never know. know. You don't never know because <laughs> that guy can turn back the clock, and he's playing a different role for Philadelphia than he did in Houston, and you know because it's one of, and, and Brooklyn as well. You know he's becoming more of a facilitator. He's more of a point guard. He plays yeah. more of a point guard than a scoring guard. And but when he wants to score, there's not too many people Mark can stop him. He can get to the basket at wheel, left hand, right hand. He can shoot the three. It's just a matter of, like, you know, what they need him to do. If they need him to score. Doc Rivers says, hey, we need you to go get 30 tonight. He'll go get 30. You think Boston then ultimately wins that series if, if they win game six? <sighs> no. Oh, you still like Philly? Okay. I still like Philadelphia. Philadelphia, for some reason, man, they, they just – it's like Jokic. I mean, you got a dominant big that causes problems, that forces – he forces double teams – any place on the floor, left block, right block, elbows, you know, 10 feet away, 15 feet away from the basket. He forces double teams. He forces your defense to have to make adjustments. Where is the double going to come from? Is it going to come baseline? Is it going to come top? And he's got a high basketball IQ. He understands where angles are. He understands he can see the floor. He sees you coming, and he knows exactly what he wants to do with the ball. He's not forcing anything. He's not trying to run people over, but he also imposes his will when he wants to get inside and, and mm -hmm. camp out in that middle of the lane, and there's nothing you can do about that. So we caught you up on what's going on in the current playoffs. We're going to go in the Wayback Machine and revisit Wayback. some great memories for Bulls fans. The championship era with Phil Jackson as the head coach. We'll also talk about his time in Los Angeles, his days as a player in New York, and so much more. Before we get to that, Whispers, did you see uh, your buddy Christopher Walken in uh, Vegas? Yeah, he was in the casino gambling <laughs> like he always is. <laughs> And so the thing that was that we talked about is that Jewel finally got shipped the sauce. And nice. it's gonna be on the shelf next Stacey's week. Stacy's signature hot sauce in your Jewel Osco store. That's right. And then we gotta go there and do some celebrity, you know, a showdown, I guess. You gotta come as Bane and then we're gonna show them what we can do with that sauce. That'd be great. Yeah, a little cooking, maybe get Traeger. <sighs> no. Bane is asleep right now. He had a rough night last night. Bane had a rough night last night, baby. <laughs> hey, Chris, tell the folks how they can get the bottle of the signature hot sauce until uh, the, their next trip to Jewel. Yeah, in the meantime, just go to gimmethehotsauce.com. Use King21 and get 21% off your first order. There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Timmy's back to lovingly pack your hot sauce. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's, thanks. He's packing it.
<laughs> packing it up. Packing it. <laughs> packing it. So Ugh. soon available in your local Jewel Osco it's stores. Coming. Make sure it's to coming. check it out. It's going to be in with the uh, with all the hot sauces. Wow. And Stacy's is the best. So make sure oh. to pick up so a bottle next time. Supposedly a coupon is going to go out too. Okay. Oh, that's, that's nice. what they said. Oh. This thing kicked off right. Hey, we getting it all right over there. Don't sleep so look on for Jewel, your, baby. Look for Stop your flyer, Jewel, baby. <laughs> <laughs> look for your Jewel flyer. Yeah, oh, pick up yeah. a bottle next time you visit your local Jewel Osco's. But coming up next. I know a lot of people have been looking forward to this ever since the announcement came out. Phil Jackson, the Zen Master. We've got plenty to talk about with Phil. That's next on Gimme the Hot Sauce. A very special guest joining us now on Gimme the Hot Sauce, the Hall of Fame coach, Phil Jackson, joining us from his home in Montana. Phil, thank you for making time for us. And I know that you probably have a good relationship with our guy, Stacy King. He's uh, one of a kind. When did you know that Stacy would have a big career after basketball in broadcasting or maybe stand-up comedy? I mean, was Stacy always like that around the team? He was the class clown. He was a comedian. <laughs> he was a guy that could mock the way I walked, the way I talked. He could uh, have fun at other people's expense. And I always tell this story. For people that want to talk about Stacy's, that I used to have a bullseye, a target bullseye, concentric rings that go around the bullseye, and I would give it to the players and ask them, where do you fit in this group of guys in idea of where the bullseye or the heart of the team is or what we're doing? And then after the all-star break, we break it open and look at it. We talk about that situation. Stacy gave me his bullseye diagram. He had Michael, Scotty, Horace Grant right close to the center with John Paxson and Bill Carbright and BJ and other people with concentric rings. And Stacy was on the outside of the bullseye, right at the very. I said, Stacy, you're the guy that makes everybody laugh. You should be inside <laughs> this. <laughs> but he, he felt that way because I think of his playing time. I think there was one issue at the time. And he was like feeling like, oh, you know, maybe I'm not that wanted or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, he came through in that fourth quarter against Portland in the, you know, the 92 championships. And, you know, everybody remembers that uh, tremendous surge that we had even with the deficit that we went into the quarter with and ended up winning and Stacey is a big part of that. Talk a little bit about Phil when you when you took the job um, as the head coach of the Bulls and what that experience was like because you came as the assistant and then I my my I got drafted and then I got the phone call that you were you were going to be the coach. Talk a little bit about what that experience was coming from an assistant to head job and then what changes you had to make when you went from that role. Well, um, you know, I had come into the Bulls organization as kind of a replacement of a young coach. The two assistants that were with me were Johnny Bach and Tex Winter, who were in their 60s at the time. And I was maybe four or five years older than Doug Collins, but we played against each other. We'd gone through a playoffs against each other. I had actually guarded him at particular times at some point um, during his um, initial year. He set out his first year, obviously, after coming out of Illinois, Northern Illinois, and having a knee injury. But we had a relationship, and I was hired, and Doug uh, kind of relied on me and relied on his assistant coaches to fill out the defensive forums and lead the team in discussions or whatever. And I came in at the same time with Scotty Pippen and Horace Grant. So I had a relationship with a couple of rookies that turned out to be, you know, super players for the, for the Bulls. The um, advent of how it all transpired is, you know, one of those crazy things about knowing people and having support and Tex Winters uh, influence with Jerry Krause and the idea that uh, I was a systems coach. I was a guy that played in the system in New York. I had a couple of championships there, was on championship teams that had great success for five years, six years actually. And uh, the uh, idea that we needed to have something more than, you know, individual plays, Michael Jordan scoring 37, 38, 40 points a game. 
uh, was, uh, I think, really the the big trial because we've been beaten by Detroit three years in a row. Initially, right off the bat, then we challenged them into a series. Then we played a seven game series with them, and then we finally overcame the the Pistons. And it was through using a system and the automatics that created the system that allowed for other people to be featured in an offense. So in the process, bringing Michael Jordan in and telling Michael Jordan that, hey, we're going to run a system. You're not going to be a scoring champion, maybe. There's not been a scoring champion that has won an NBA ch- title since I don't know when. Let's see, maybe Rick Barry back in 75. So quite a few years, 12 years since a scoring champion won a championship. And Michael said, oh, that's no problem. I can win a scoring championship, you know, scoring 31, 32 points. I said, uh, well, it's going to be more of a distribution of the ball. And he said, you mean it's going to be equal opportunity in offense? I said, yeah, well, everybody's going to be part of the offense. So what happens when the 24 second clock runs down and Bill Cartwright has the ball in his hands? (laughs) (laughs) That's what coaches do. They teach players how to get the ball to a guy that can create his own shot. You'll get the ball. You'll find out. (laughs) So (laughs) he said, the the last thing he said to me is like, you know, I can get eight points a quarter, you know? I said, really, you know, you don't need to do that. You don't need to make that a goal. But just make sure you get that 10 or 12 points in the fourth quarter. That's the one that counts. (laughs) So we we left on good terms. So that was it. But it was a a trial and error because the triangle, as you know, takes some effort. It takes a, a group of five people working together. We always said it's like fingers on a hand. Try to zip up your jacket and only have one or two fingers on your hand working. Doesn't happen. You need to have all all the players participating in the offense. And in such a way, that's why the defense has to be playing everybody and they can't be just focused on one guy, which is happening to Michael Jordan. By the defensive uh, rules that Detroit had put together called the Jordan rules where he puts it on the floor and we go get him and we knock him on the floor. That was their, de- yeah. Yeah. <laughs> their de- defensive strategy. Hey, Phil, Stacy's told a great story for our listeners about his pre-draft workout. You know, back in those days, you could make guys play two-on-two two full court. You could put them through all kinds of physically demanding tests. Now the agents won't let them do anything. Well, well Stacy's told us that the physical, it got kind of physical in the post, and he thought he was going up against former player Dave Corzine. Little did he know that he was going up against Phil Jackson, who was soon to be <laughs> his new head coach, and Stacy was totally mystified as to who you were. Do you recall that whole thing? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but did you, but, did, uh, you, did you put a lot of prospects through workouts back in those days? Yeah. I mean, I was the, you know, one of the assistant coaches that could, you know, do the activity. Doug usually took care of the guards and I took care of the big guys and tried to see what they had or what they could do. And, you know, Johnny Bach and Tex Winter were in their 60s. They weren't able to get out in the court, although Tex Winter could feed the post better than almost anybody. (laughs) He, He loved to do that. Let's talk a little bit, talk a little bit about the, you know, going into that, going into the Bulls after we won our first championship, and how hard it was to to keep our team mentally focused. Because one thing I always give you credit for is you let the players police themselves. You know, we had good leaders, strong leaders in the locker room, and you you reinforced a lot of that. But we had like Bill Cartwright, John Pax, and guys that that kept guys in line. But talk about how difficult it was to not just win one, but to put two and three together. Well, that was one of the things I, I I had Bill Walton out to a camp that I did on a Native American Indian reservation in Pine Ridge, South Dakota. They had won a championship, and I told Bill, the big key and the big regret we had as New York Knicks was that we went, we did win back-to-back. We never were able to repeat. We did repeat in a couple of years and got another championship at 73. But that back, that next year is really difficult to do. 
there's injuries, there's discontent, there's, you know, people moving ahead of other people in the process. In our, our particular case, um, I have a totem uh, that's in my house that has all the players from the three championship teams uh, in Chicago in the first run, Chicago in the second run, and with the Lakers. In the first run with the Chicago Bulls, there are 11 players on that totem that stayed together for three championships. On the second totem, there are 10. On the totem that's for the Lakers, there are just six players, which tells you the difference that happened to the game. The players that were with the Chicago Bulls were there consecutively because they knew how to play together. And I tell the story about Jerry Reinsdorf calling the uh, calling me up at the All Star no the um, yeah it's the All Star game I think it was in Orlando or something like that and he called me up and said Are you trying to beat the record for most can, most wins in the season You're forty six and five something like that at the midway point or that point in the All Star break I said Not at all This team just knows how to win They just go out and put it together. I make substitutions, but these guys have the formula. They know how to do it. And if we stay healthy, you know, I don't know what will happen. Now, we did have an injury. We got a, an injury at the end of the year. We brought in a couple guys to fill in a 10-day contract. But we were consecutively playing guys that knew how to play together and knew their roles. Phil, this team, uh, the Bulls team's, are really celebrated even to this day. It's been almost 25 years now since the last championship in 98, but the the nation was kind of reintroduced to that squad during the last dance documentary that came out during the pandemic. And really people were just looking for something to watch in terms of a sports audience. Did you watch the last dance and what was your impression of how the team was portrayed? Yes, of course it was fascinating. Um, you know, you always look at somebody else's image of what they think was going on. Um, you know, I, I got calls from guys, um, <laughs> who were, uh, Luke Longley from Australia. Luke, Luke was like, I feel like I'm going on what 60 minutes, uh, show here in Australia. And they're wondering, why aren't you in the, in the, um, version of, uh, the last day? <laughs> why, why do we never see you you know, on the screen? I said, well, I, I got previews, and I could tell you that, uh, you know, number nine and ten, uh, you're featured. You have some moments in there, Luke, that will redeem your whatever, <laughs> your your role as the starter as, as the uh, Chicago Bulls. But um, it did it did uh, omit people. Ronnie Harper didn't get, you know, as much credit, uh, you know, because Steve Kerr is a known entity, he got a lot of credit in a, seventh game against Indiana in that series that year, whereas Tony Kukoc was really the outstanding player. People forgot Tony was starting and Dennis Rodman was coming off the bench in a couple of the last two series in that last dance year. So there's some things that get lost in the process. And it was, you know, a lot of it was Michael and Michael's version of, of what went on. But it was fascinating and it was, I think, good for the public to see it. And I think it was good for basketball. Now, we have this discussion all the time with Kenny Smith and, and Robert Ory, all these these Houston Rocket guys. And, you know, it's always a discussion when we say – they always want to say that, you know, we won three. And I always say if Michael wouldn't win to go chase curveballs, those titles that they had would have been ours. And we could have been looking – that Bulls – that Bulls – team could have been looking at maybe winning six in a row, seven, eight, and who knows, but we get into this argument all the time. Do you think if Michael would have stayed and not retired that year after the third championship, do you think that we could have won that, that championship? That's life. I mean, that's really <laughs> what life's all about. Maybe if and ands, right? Yeah. But there, there's no doubt that that team, well, you know, without Michael, we had a great season that next year, you know, we really played well. Uh, I think going into the last weekend of the year, we were tied for first place in the Eastern Conference. And, you know, the team's dynamic showed, their structure showed, the idea that they knew how to play together showed. 
and that extra element that would have been Michael Jordan would have been the, you know, put us over the top. And, uh, you know, but it turned out to be, you know, what was necessary in his life, you know. Um, he'd gone through a lot of hardship with his father dying, murdered on the road, you know, in a situation that was really devastating. And, you know, the value, and, and he came to my, well, situation arose that, you know, he had to go through me to go back to baseball or to go to baseball, according to Jerry Reinsdorf. And so I met with him and he was like, I don't think there's anything more for me to do. And I said, well, you know, there's more, you can win more championships. Yeah, we've done that. And that's been great. But, you know, that's, you know, whatever. Um, I guess that's the biggest thing is that we won three in a row and no one's been able to do that since the Celtics. So, you know, that that was accomplished. I really don't think there's anything more that is challenging for me in basketball. And I said, well, really sorry to see that because, you know, what basketball means to you doesn't compare to what you mean to basketball because what you bring to basketball is something that no one can really replace. And that's why we've called you Michelangelo and in, in, in your, uh, you know, as referring to you. And I know we refer to him as the black cat a lot of times yeah. too, but <laughs> that's, that's the guy. And, you know, he had that extra special element in him that made him, you know, a winner and it made us a champion. Speaking of Michael Jordan, there's always that great debate about uh, who's the greatest of all time. Uh, LeBron James just passed Kareem as the all-time leading scorer. He's uh, chasing perhaps his fifth championship this year. Phil, where do you weigh in on the greatest of all time debate? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. You know, you can't take anything away from either player. They're absolutely terrific players. You can only turn to the fact that Michael went to the finals six times and won six championships. And there's another thing that's kind of funny about um, seventh games. How many seventh games in the final series did Michael have to go through? And there was never did. That never yeah. happened. We won in, you know, six at the most. But, uh, you know, the reality is, is that the record stands and that that's what happens in careers. And the, the game has changed. And the players have changed and how the game has been played has also changed. So, you know, take nothing away from either player. It's still a fact that Michael went to the finals six times and won six championships. You talk about the, the game changing, you know, and you look at every night when I watch the games, you know, everybody talks about the triangle offense. Nobody wants to run it. Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a college offense. They never want to give Tex winner his credit that he deserved as, as it, that offense has won many, many titles. But every night I see some kind of variation, whether it be pinch post action, whether it be, you know, rub action, split cuts, uh, fist side, there's, there's always some variations of the triangle. What, what is it that makes people afraid to run that offense in a, in a game where, Phil, when you watch games now, it's just chucking up threes. There's no ball movement. There's no consistency on offense. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think that I think the game has gotten away from coaching, and I think it's gone to more what kids learn in the AAU ball growing up: how to beat players one on one, um, how to beat people off the dribble, and then the way to get free on uh, dribbling offenses like this is with a screen. So screen roll has become the premier premier action that's created in this game. The uh, advent of the three-point line, you know, we saw it was going to happen. I think we had a record in the championship against Phoenix, uh, making threes in the final game there. Um, that didn't last too long. I, I, but I do think it took until uh, Miami beat Oklahoma for that record to fall in the finals, most three-pointers in a game. So a lot of people say that the triangle doesn't adhere to the three-point shot. But that's not true either. Because, you know, we prided ourselves in the fact that using all the different types of action in basketball can be used and is facilitated by this offense because you just, it's just basketball. And we do it by overloading the floor. And that's, that's one of the things. But the reality is how many times you watch an NCAA team 
or an NBA team go down the court with pressure and a point guard that's struggling to bring the ball up the court and he ends up getting his pocket picked like Steve, uh, like Curry did in the game against, uh, you know, the Lakers in the maybe is the second or third game or the, the struggle of bringing the ball up the court creates a 24 second violation. The team can't get into their offense. And the two guard front, which we adopted, which was like, um, you know, heresy at that time, created all these options for automatics, which break down pressure. It was what exactly was had to happen to beat various teams, particularly in finals. And uh, when you have a guard that's bringing the ball or horsing the ball up, there's always somebody that can get on and pressure him. So far, you know, we haven't seen anybody get up on pressure to LeBron James when he has to play point guard and pressure him full court so that it changes the complexity of their game. But that's ultimately what's going to have to happen in, in the process in this series. At some level, they're going to have to be applying pressure. And pressure defense is what breaks down offenses. And the two-guard front and the triangle offense specializes in breaking down frontline pressure. And so for high-intensity pressure basketball, this had to be adapted. Even though sometimes it's a little clunky, sometimes it's difficult for players to learn all the actions and all of the uh, system reactions of the two guard key passes, uh, the two key passes that are made. But it's really a function of how to beat teams that apply good pressure defense. You went on to take the triangle offense to Los Angeles with the Lakers, and you mentioned the difficulty in getting Michael to buy in. What was it like with Shaq and Kobe at that time, both young stars who probably both in their own minds thought they were the best player in the league? Was that a difficult uh, challenge for you to try to manage those egos? No, it wasn't. But, you know, I had Ronnie Harper come along with us, and he started uh, along with Kobe as the guard, and he facilitated the offense. And Kobe figured figured it out because Kobe is a bright basketball player and he liked playing that role. He eventually moved down to the Michael Jordan wing spot where he did the bulk of his scoring later on in his career. And the, but in early the first three point three pin three P championship we won in LA, he was the guard, uh, along with either Derek Harper or Ronnie um, Derek Fisher or Ronnie Harper. The um, aspect of having Shaq as the pivot point or the central point in the triangle offense was right up the alley because that was his MVP year and he averaged the most points he ever averaged. So he was the focal point. So that was easy to, you know, to get him involved in that. And he feasted on it and has always been a proponent of it. But we, we had to use a variety of actions uh, they created opportunities because the game changed. Double teams could happen. Zones were more available. But we still had an ability to manipulate the offense in a way that he could be featured. And uh, so that was the success of that team. The success later of the Lakers was the fact that we had two big guys, Pau Gasol right. and Andrew Bynum, that started together. They were able to really play both pinch post and post play and uh, that really changed how teams had the ability to defend us. So, yeah, it, it was successful, and it takes a lot of coaching and a lot of skill training and a lot of teaching players. And a lot of the kids that come out of, you know, one-year college, done and uh, one and done, haven't had the skills necessary to adapt to that type of a system. They haven't had the coaching that's uh, – you know, gone into it. So really, it, it maybe is a little archaic. It might be archaic. And I, I think when I went to New York and tried to feature it in New York, it was a difficult situation for us there because we had a, we had a couple of players that really didn't want to play it. They really didn't want to explore it. And we had kids that were learning at the time that uh, we were trying to put together a team. So, yeah, it's had its uh, promise. We've won 11 championships with it. And it's been featured, but, you know, it's a coaching's nightmare because you've really got to drill players. And players have to be willing 
to spend time learning the skills and drills that go into it. Talk about the NBA defense, Phil. One of the things that drives me crazy when I watch these games every night is the constant switching. You know, back in, in when we played, you know, it was same size guys switch. It was never, you know, bigs. We always, defensive, we always mix it up. You know, first half we may blitz the pick and roll and full rotate, or we might go push up, go underneath, hard show and get back. There was always different variations of how we played. We had some good guards we had to guard off pick and rolls. I mean, Isaiah Thomas, Stockton, Hall of Fame type guards. But we made those adjustments. And you watch today's game, you know, you get a big out there that can't slide his feet two steps, and it's a mismatch at the point of attack, and then it's a mismatch if the other team rolls their big guy, and then you're constantly scrambling to try to help one or the other, and it leaves wide open three-point shooting. So talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, beating Detroit, we end up putting Pippen on Lambeer who's a center who liked to be at the top of the key and set the picks for Isaiah and Joe Dumars. But when you come off a pick by Lambeer and Scotty Pippen's the guy that's going to come out and challenge the ball, you're in jeopardy. You're protecting the ball. You're not trying to make a play. So that was our fortune is that we could put Scotty out there and still recover back to Lambeer's right arm uh, and challenge his shot. So he was ineffective in that series. The other thing that we taught was how to get through picks. There are very few kids now that can fight through picks. You've got one in Chicago there, the ball-headed master of (laughs) challenging picks. And he's got the gumption and the knowledge of, I'm going to get through this pick. But when you watch how the referees uh, referee the top of the circle screen roll and how they referee the baseline or sideline pick screen and roll, it's totally different. The big guys can push, they can use their arms, they can jab uh, with their hands, they can move on the pick. It's uh, because it's really nebulous area. Neither referee has the position and the baseline referee is not on the really on the lane looking at the movement of the picker. So I think there's two things going into that. One, the picks have to be cleaned up so players can challenge the pick and if they can avoid it, get through it. And two, you've got to move that screener up above the three-point line. So if you do go under and recover, the guy's shooting a 30-foot jumper instead of a 24 or 25-foot jumper. So, I mean, that's that's one of the keys. And you're right. The rotations now that players are hanging out in the corners is a distant 20, 25 feet of recovery. So it's very few teams that have the speed and the recovery ability. Boston's showing a little bit of that. They've been good at it. Um, the Heat's been using their zone and been pretty effective at doing some of that too. Uh, right now, the Lakers have some defensive players that are, you know, really putting pressure on, uh, you know, the Golden State Warriors. Um, you know, Vanderbilt has, has been a fine for them because he's six seven and he's left-handed and he can challenge right-handed dribblers. And they've also got uh, Schroeder who's an effective uh, speed guard. So they got a couple of people that could put pressure on the ball and make it difficult. But when the Warriors went to, you know, Stephen Curry, you know, running the screen roll or handling the basketball instead of being off ball, it changed their ability to, to uh, threaten the Lakers' uh, defensive ability. So, yeah, there's adjustments still to be made. But I agree with you on the defense. And I, I admire the fact that, you know, the Heat have been able to use the zone at times because I was I, I like zone. I like the fact that if you can change it up and make a call, you can uh, disrupt the guys and they're not in their normal spots. And that changes up how they shoot. Hey, Phil, I know that you haven't done a whole bunch of interviews since you left the Knicks. Probably has been good for you to have, not have to deal with us pesky types in the media uh, for over the last several years. Um Recently, you appeared on Rick Rubin's podcast, and he asked you a, a very innocuous question about today's NBA, and, and you said you haven't watched much of the NBA, and you referred back to the bubble, that you didn't really like the, the political aspect of that, and some people took that in a weird direction, trying to bring a racial component to that. Is there, is there anything you'd like to clarify or, or, or say about that situation that, that maybe wasn't portrayed in today's media? <laughs> no. 
I don't, I don't think people got the humor right. uh, of the, what the names that are on the back of the players uh, that were, you know, in the bubble because of the, you know, if you apply them to defending and challenging and going to the hoop and you use those monikers that were on the names, it was, it, it had a funny aspect to it. And that's what, that's just what I was bringing out to the kids that visually this is kind of humorous, you know, I had nothing against BLM or the or the cause that was behind it, but the, the humorous nature of you know going completely woke by the NBA really was like it's pretty hard to watch. <laughs> hey Phil, you've had to manage some of the biggest personalities in uh, in the game, but the curious one always is Dennis Rodman and how you managed him, uh, letting him go fight Hulk Hogan one night and then uh, still have him play a game the next day. How did you get through all that with Dennis for all those years? Long leash. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a long leash? And he just left him at that? <laughs> well, that was a comment that you can't discipline him. We had, we had a number of players that we had an option after Michael came by, back and we had had, you know, a couple of young power forwards and replaced Horace Grant and we lost to Orlando where Horace Grant had migrated to. We had a, a couple of options going into the year that Michael returned and, you know, we looked at the options and all of them were costly. None of them that extreme. If you went with San Antonio and Will Perdue went in exchange for Dennis Rodman, and the big deal was, can you handle Dennis Rodman? So anyway, I set up a meeting with Dennis, and uh, it was at Jerry Krause's home. And I went in, and you know, Dennis had all his rings in his nose, in his lip, in his ears. He had a pole boy <laughs> hat pulled down over sunglasses. You couldn't see him. And I said, uh, Dennis, when you meet somebody, you stand up and shake hands with them, right? Stand up and shake hands. That's how we do it is, you know, man to man. Why don't we go outside and sit down and talk and see what we can work out together. So all Dennis wanted to talk about was that he wasn't getting paid for what he produces. And I said, well, you came to an organization that is never paid without people producing. If you produce, you get paid here. And, you know, you're going to have to pay play at your contract level this year. But if you play well, you're going to get paid because this is an organization that rewards people that play well. But they don't care if contracts or make changes in contracts. We talked a little bit more, whatever, whatever. The next day we went back to the training site in the morning. I said I'd meet him for coffee in the morning at the training site. And I had that room that had all the Native American artifacts in it that were, you know, these <laughs> Native American groups of people had sent me like prayer arrows and headdress and bear yep. claw necklaces and a variety of things. And we kind of made a tribal uh, affinity towards, you know, our relationship with one another, that we were a tribe of warriors. And, uh, Dennis walked in the room and he looked around and he went like, oh, you know, there's a tribe down in Oklahoma when I went to Southeast, Southwest, South North or whatever, Oklahoma State, that gave me this necklace and he pulled it out from underneath his shirt. Yeah, I can dig this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's kind of what we do here. We kind of get in a group and we kind of form our own little tribe and we try to go out and play ball together. He said, well, the offense, I can figure that offense out. I don't need to shoot. And that's, that was, that was his claim. <laughs> and that's what he did. He never shot. He yeah. just made passes and made, and set picks and offensive rebounded. So that, that worked out to be a charm. Before he came, he still had to go back and do some things. I sat down with the players and we all had, we all were veteran players there that were on this team. We had one rookie. And I said, normally we have to be at our arena an hour and a half before the game. I set up a little fine code that we find players for if they're late or whatever. Dennis Rodman can't 
focused that long. He can't be in a place for an hour and a half before a basketball game. He could be there an hour, and you're going to find out when he comes, he's going to work out, he's going to lift weights, he's going to do all kinds of crazy things, but he's not going to shoot. He's not going to go out and shoot around before a game. And I, he's agreed, and I've agreed that he'll get fined for not coming on time. It'll be the minimum. I'm not going to find him the maximum. So whatever per minute he's late will be a dollar per minute. If you guys can live with that, we can live with this guy. And they all were like, we can live with that. So we did. <laughs> that's, that's I'll tell you what, um, that's one thing I always liked about you, Phil, because you, you let the players police themselves, and you don't really see a lot of that now. You know, the players in this, in this generation, you know, it's like uh, they're entitled you know, everything is like given. No one's working for anything. I mean, I go back to when rookies had to carry bags and, and you know, get, you know, we had responsibility. Michael Jordan kicking balls up into the stands, making, making me and BJ run up and go get balls <laughs> at shoot arounds. You just don't see that anymore. They, it's, it's like completely gone. I think it's a process, and I think that process of kids going to college and learning how to be vets in college and captains of their college team, you know, and going up the ranks to be the, the leaders and learning leadership teaches you how to be a follower so that when you come to the NBA, I got to go through this rookie process again. And if I hang in here, I can be a leader and I can know how to do this when I'm a eight, 10 year veteran. But yeah, I think it would. Uh, that kind of thing about today is that we draft these players a lot of times that were 19. I hope so. Draft. So, maybe four of them get an extended contract and the rest of them go through a process where it takes them four years, they don't get a renewed contract, they move on, they go somewhere else, and they learn how to play the game. This kid, Brown, that's playing for Denver is a prime example of that uh, right now. A kid that went through a you know draft process, you know, ran out the gamut of his time with a rookie, you know, with his original team, and now he's learned how to be a, an NBA basketball player and knows how to contribute. Comes off the bench and changes the game for a team. And, you know, you see players like that that survive in the NBA because they learn, you know, this is what happens, and it's not – I'm not going to go in, be a high draft pick, and end up, you know, getting the maximum contract right off the bat after my third or fourth year with this basketball team. Some of them do. Booker does. You got players that do that, but it's a small majority of guys that the, the 30 guys get drafted every year. So it puts a high demand on these players, tremendous uh, ladder to go up and reach. As a consequence, it becomes so individual, it becomes – so like I got to get that maximum contract. I got to show my my level of expertise immediately, as opposed to learning how to play and how the game is played. If Phil, uh, one of the things that Stacy always brings up is back in the day, they hated the other team and that that uh, and drove them to play harder. And now today, after every game, everyone's hugging it out and <laughs> and everyone gets along. They all go to dinner together. And do you think that's changed the game? In a way, we, you know, obviously with Detroit Pistons, you know, we had multiple fights. Scotty Pippen got hit across the face, had a concussion. Um, Doug Collins got thrown over the scorer's desk by Mayhorn. You know, those things you don't forget when you have those kind of battles. And the bad boys were like that. They created those situations in Detroit. So it was easy to challenge or be part of that or to get animosity as, you know, and the, Alternative. One of the things that turned around our ability to play against Detroit was retaliation never works. They never see the first foul. When you get an elbow in the chest or in the chops and you retaliate, the referee sees the second one. He's going to call you for it and you're going to pay the penalty. So you absorb the blow and you get it back later. You know, you do it later on, you find a way to get it done the way it has to be done by playing basketball, by beating this guy, by, you know, whatever is the expertise of basketball that you could produce. 
So we tried to take that out of it. And that was one of the things about, you know, this Native American thing that I had is that one of the things about the Native Americans is that they always valued their enemies. Because if they don't have an enemy, you don't have someone to challenge you. How are you going to reach the pinnacle of your ability? How are you going to survive and be the best you can be? So, you know, that was kind of a philosophy that we adopted. And it worked for us. Whether players could be friends and whatnot, I think once you step on the court, you know, if you want to make it real, you got to really play hard. And, you know, that might mean not picking the guy up off the floor. You're like, okay, we knocked you down. Get up off the floor. You know, you challenge us. You went to the basket. We challenge you. And that's what you get. That's part of the game. So I think that's uh, I think that's part of the, the game of basketball. One of the reasons I like playoff hockey so much is because you never see those guys quit. In playoff hockey, they skate, you know, they're they're forty five to one minute rotation, like they're running a four forty or four hundred meter dash. It's all out, balls to the wall. And you like to see that in, in sport and also there's not the interruption going to the monitor game delayed for five minutes while we decide whether it's a flagrant foul or not a flagrant foul. You know, there's all these activities that go on now that make the game non-fluid. Now, you know, even, even in the original day, we didn't have that middle timeout that's in the, in the second quarter and the fourth quarter. So there's more continuous action in basketball, which is an action game and has been, you know, slowed down, delayed, and, you know, when they talk about a guy playing 48 minutes and all the stops in the game that are now, I don't understand why more guys can't play 48 minutes in the ball game. They can do it. It's just a matter of, you know, the mental fatigue, I think, more than anything else. But I think the game has to improve and has to change. And it's never been static. Basketball has always been a game that's changed with the times. And it could be done. Speaking speaking of that, you know the forty eight minutes and guys playing forty eight minutes. What what do you think, Phil, about the the load management um, that you see a lot of guys missing games because they're tired or, you know, talk a little bit about that. That's BS. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, we we practiced all the time. You know, we, I tell people that Phil, they think I'm crazy. We practiced no, three we games in four nights, all the time. and guys did get injured. And, you know, I, I heard that Sacramento is one team that practiced this year and they were able to, you know, not have a lot of injuries. Now, they did have some at the end of the year in the playoffs, but you saw what happened to Sacramento. Their game improved dramatically, but it became kind of a thing. And I don't know whether it was an extension of your years, your your career. I don't, I don't know really the value behind that. But we, we laugh all the time about it. The trainers that I had, Chip Schaefer, yep. who, you know, back with Chicago, we, we laugh about the fact that, you know, we just didn't have injuries. We had guys go through a season. You might have one injury. Someone sprained an ankle. He missed a game. Rosters didn't change. We had 12 guys on the plane, you know, an hour and a half after the game, flying back home. And, uh, you know, that was, that was the way it was played. And I think the players – like it. I think they like to be constantly drilled and constantly honing their skills. Now the only skill that guys work on is shooting. And you know, the rest of it at timing, passing, footwork, you know, the other alternative aspects of skills in the basketball game have to be taught too. I mean <laughs> I, I won't start, but if if you watch a game with the eyes that I have and the knowledge that I have of the game you see how corrupted the game is. They, you know, how they dribble, the carry, the delayed dribble, the uh, inability to pivot correctly, the ability to walk into shots or travel consistently. There are no pivot moves that make sense. It, you know, the game has deteriorated from that point. And I, I understand where they were like, okay, we're not going to spend a lot of time teaching these kids because they've learned so much playing AU ball from 14 on through 18 or 20 years of age. We just want them to bring their best talent to the game. But to me, it looks a little bit like Rutgers League or, or you know, uh, Baker League, which were the prominent street games in the uh, 60s and 70s. 
You got a favorite Stacey King story you can share with our audience? Because everybody loves Stacey. You got something from a game or practice you can share that can really bring out the essence of Stacey King? No, I do not. (laughs) I will tell you that there was a game in which he did not play well, that he ended up coming on the plane with Colt 45s. And he ended up being helped off the plane by his teammates. <laughs> now there's a story. There we go. <laughs> you remember that, Stace? Yeah, was, I do. What was the game? What was the game? It was, it was, it was, it was we were uh, we were in Seattle. We, we played we played why. we played Seattle yeah. SuperSonics. And after the game, I had some Colt 45. So some of my friends dropped me some off. I, I didn't play well, and I was a little upset about it. So I tried to drown my sorrows away. And then Michael Jordan had a cigar, and he kept blowing this cigar smoke in my face. And I almost yeah. threw up because I was drunk. <laughs> and then I passed out, and Bill Carre put me on a on one of those little carts where they put the luggage on. Right. And he rolled me to him at PAX, took me to my room. And the next morning, I woke up probably about 10 o'clock because we had a day off. I woke up at 10 o'clock. I didn't even remember where I was, <laughs> how I got there. <laughs> but all I know, I was sick as a dog, baby. <laughs> Woo! Yes, you feel you remember that. <laughs> and his teammates took care of him. And we all understood what was going on and why. Sometimes you have to face it. And that, that was one of the nights Stacy. <laughs> Stacey had the face. <laughs> I don't drink Colt 45 this, to this day, Phil, because of that. This is Billy D. Williams was sponsored. Uh, I went back in the day. Hey, forget Billy D. Williams, okay? <laughs> He's not no friend of mine, all right? I don't drink no more of that stuff. No, no, no. PJ, good job, man. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it, bro. Good to see you. How the kids doing? Thanks, how, 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 how's the family? Great. Um, all my kids are out here last weekend, and... Uh, you know, we have this foundation meeting that we go through the last weekend of April. So they came out, my five kids, and one of the few times we get together now that they're, they're not bothered by children. And I can see them and get a hold of them and, you know, give them some crap. How many, <laughs> how many grandkids you got now? I have 11. Wow. wow. You know, during, during the pandemic summer, we had 22 up here in Montana hanging out on the lake. So we had a, a great time. Wow. Thanks for asking. Thanks, guys. Go Thank you so much, PJ. Phil. We appreciate it. Phil Jackson, our guest on Give Me the Hot Sauce. Thanks, Coach. We really appreciate Phil Jackson joining us. He does not do many interviews at all, and uh, it was really kind of him to spend so much time with us. And it was funny at the end, you know, I thought he might have a good story. And he goes, well, I don't have a story. <laughs> and as we were in the break uh, after that interview, you were saying, uh, give us a few more details about the Colt 45 incident. <sighs> America is a reason why uh, Colt 45 is not a sponsor. Okay. Uh, I was probably was 21 at the time. America. I was mad because I was my rookie year. I didn't play well. I was upset. My boy, Andre Montgomery, shout out to my boy, Andre Montgomery in Seattle. With This is when the Sonics were still yeah, in Seattle. Yeah. And so after the game, you know, I didn't play well and I, I played, played a lot of minutes, but I didn't play well. And I was upset that I didn't play well. So I had told my boy, Andre, I said, Hey, look, you know, I'm going to get on the plane. Make sure you bring those Colt 45s so I can take them on the plane with me to L.A. He's like, I got you. I got you, big bro. I got you, big bro. So he brings him in. I said, man, damn the plane. I'm the Drake of now because I, I was just trying to drown my sorrows away. Mark. So I'm driving these big, big Colt 45 yeah. bottles, you know. Boom, I'm drinking them. Boom, down it. And, and now you got to remember, I, I didn't eat. I was dehydrated. And I'm drinking Colt 45 yeah. all liquor. And it went straight to the head. <laughs> I, 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 I got on the I got on the bus. I was one of the last people to go on the bus. I was almost saying, nobody knows how dry I am. You know? So I get on the bus. So we won the game. So I'm in the back of the bus. Michael Jordan has a cigar. And he's puffing the cigar. You know, he's like, hey, Rook, that's all right. You'll get him next time. And he's blowing cigarette cigar smoke in my face. And if you know anything about being, you know, intoxicated and having smoke come in your face, yeah. you just feel like you're just going to yak, you know. And I told him to stop before I did it. <laughs> so he stopped. So the next thing I know, I passed out on the plane. And uh, I don't know how I got off the plane to get on the bus. I don't know how I got to the hotel. We were going to L.A. We were playing the Lakers. And we were staying in the Marina Del Rey, Ritz-Carlton. That's all I remember. Next thing you know, I woke up the next morning, probably, probably 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I was on my back. Laid out, still, you know, just still recovering from that night. And so I'm like, I don't know how I got in there. Uh, my clothes were still on. I hear the knock on the door. Boom, 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 boom. Hey. <laughs> hey, open the door. Open the door, Rooks. And so I'm like, who is it? And I know who it was because of the voice. You yeah, know, he's yeah. like, it's Billy C. Open the door. So I open the door. And so I'm like, what's up, T? She's like, let me tell you something. <laughs> 
<laughs> don't you ever do that again. I don't ever want to see you touch that, <laughs> touch that liquor again. And I'm like, and it was like my dad talking. Well, sure, to me. yeah. So I'm like, Bill, I'm already two steps ahead of you, bro. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm done that. with that. I will never. <laughs> ever, and that, and I swear on everything I love, I have not drank cold 45 cents. Yeah, that was a lesson learned. There you go. And it was, a, it was a brutal lesson. <laughs> it was a brutal lesson. Stacy King on the road. That being a rookie, uh, you make those mistakes, but you only do it once. So yeah. That, that, yeah, you only do it once, America. I yeah. thought he might bring up the Larry Bird story. Get up on him! Hey, well, you know what? <laughs> you know what? We should have brought that up because I'm still mad about that. You know, we'll, we'll talk about that. It's in, what's in the episode? What episode was that in? Uh, we have to scour the library. Yeah, scour the library. Hey, America, <laughs> we have a library. <laughs> America, we ha we have a we have a library. We have a catalog. Okay, we, we, just, we don't just have five shows. We have how many shows, got, guys? This is one twenty nine. One hundred and twenty nine yeah. episodes of giving the hot sauce. So we have a catalog. Couple of quick notes before we get out of here. The NFL schedule released today. Yes. We did find out that the Bears will start and end the season playing the Green Bay Packers. The first game, <sighs> September 10th at Soldier Field, the last game at Lambeau Field, and there could be a changing of the guard no. in the NFC hey, North. Listen. Soon as Aaron Rodgers left, the, the guard was already changed. The door, <laughs> the door was open. We finna kick the door down to bear. Those are gonna be two wins right there, there baby. Put those two wins on the schedule, baby. <laughs> There's a new king in town. Forget Detroit. Forget Minnesota. It's the Chicago Bears. Remember, I told y'all that. And the Bears have two Thursday night games, two oh. Monday night games. Those Thursday night games have been stinkers in the past, you know, because teams don't like that quick turnaround. They put them on the on the prime network. They got it's two? Like two. Yeah, they play like Carolina wow. and I think the Washington Commanders. Is that more rare? Wins. Is that rare? I've never <laughs> they seen. They changed that. It used to be they only made teams only do it once, once. cuz yeah. it's not fair to have that short turnaround. Yeah, that's but they got two Thursday night games. Okay, so are they doing that saying all the bad teams play two games uh, on Thursday? I don't I mean, want to say, I don't go say that. We got to go look at the schedule and see <laughs> yeah. which teams got two games on Thursday night. Yeah. I guarantee the super teams don't have them. No, I guarantee. No, they're not going to make it. I guarantee. Two they think they're slick. They think they're slick. I know it. Oh, Oh, I, did, did we talk about this last week? Dave Wanstead. Remember we were talking about the, yeah. the, 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 the America's team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody knew that story. Right. I told at least 100 people that story. They go, no way. Yeah. No way. I go, yes. That's how Dallas got the got the America's team uh, nickname. So go back and check that out. That was last week's show. Episode 128 with that Dave That should be Wanstead. on a Jeopardy question. <laughs> that should go. be on a Jeopardy question. <laughs> Hey, good news for Blackhawk fans. I know we don't talk a lot of hockey here, but it could be a new generation of Blackhawk success. They won the lottery. They were third with Honor. the third best odds. They are going to draft the 17-year-old Canadian sensation, Connor Bedard. This guy reminds me so much of Patrick Kane, great stick handler. He had 72 goals, 71 assists in 57 games in the Canadian wow. Junior League. This guy's unbelievable. He is considered to be, along with uh, Sidney Crosby and Connor but, uh, what's McDavid, the McDavid. best prospects to come into the league. Well, so. I'll tell you what, there's only a few of us can handle sticks like that. I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at you people. Yeah. Look at all you freaks. Okay, listen, I'm going to tell you something. That's What if the Bulls get the number one pick? Tuesday's lottery. Uh, what, what if the Bulls... We oui, we. Oui. Oh, <laughs> I gotta start. I'm gonna start getting my friends ready, baby. Because I, hey, listen, wouldn't that be something? Victor that be, What are our chances? What are our chances of getting one point eight? It's just like Derrick Rose. One point. The year the Rose. Yeah, and the year the Hawks yeah. got Kane. Was that the same year, right? No. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it yeah. was the same year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so wow. they got Taves so they the year could, before in 07. Wow. Lightning could strike twice here. Yeah, wow. wouldn't that be something? That would, I'm would telling be. you, boy, hey, listen, if the Bulls got the number one pick, because if it's not in the top four, they got to give it to Orlando, right? That's right. So we got to get somewhere in the top Need four. Need some luck. I, I'd like to get number one. So yeah. if you're out there, uh, Adam Silver, you know, don't be afraid to make the ping pong balls go cold or whatever they do to give us a little trick like they That's did right. Patrick Ewing. <laughs> whatever we need, we, we, hey, Chicago need, huh? What's that? Magnets? Whatever mm -hmm. it takes. Whatever it takes, baby. Bring Whatever Victor it takes. here to play for the Bulls. Part of who I say? Speaking of scared, Stacy's got a movie he wants to tell you about. It's brought to you by our friends at Bigger's Mazda. Their sizzling new Elgin location at Randall Road is the biggest Mazda store in the state of Illinois. Bigger's is offering a bottle of Stacy's signature hot sauce with first test drives of new or pre-owned vehicles. It's your choice. Everything from the coolest SUVs to the stunning Miata. So join the fun at 2100 Randall Road, it's in Elgin at Bigger's Mazda. Tell them uh, Whisper sent you, and they may send you the other way. I don't know. <laughs>
That's probably true. <laughs> so yeah, make sure you do that. And you get with test drive. You get a oh, bottle of Stacy's signature man? sauce. Oh, that's the pizza guy. Okay, we got, right. we now have, we now listen, we got food. You know, where's our security yeah. at? Yeah. Okay, we just anybody can wander in Anybody here. can yeah. walk yeah. in. Yeah. Here. I gotta start, man. Well, yeah. Well, in the next few weeks, we're gonna plan a uh, site visit to Biggers and okay, out some sauce and. Right, that's yes. coming up. Yeah. And we'll ride around in a little Mazda Miata ourselves. Yeah, okay. I'm Stacy in that. Well, that sounds like some fun. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. Stacy, tell them about the movie you saw. Put it up there, boys. The oh, Pope's no. Exorcist. I saw it the other night. Is it scary as the original? Uh, no. Okay. No, there's nothing ever scary. Well, this is based on a true story, isn't this it? This is true. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is a true story. I'm going to tell you something, man. It, it did creep me out a little bit. It did creep me out. I thought Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> well, it was, it was a scary one, but this is <laughs> that still cracks me up every time you bring that. The up. Winnie the Pooh, y'all, I'm telling y'all, man, Winnie the Pooh. There's a horror movie called Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh, nasty it, SOB. It, it, I'm telling you, they changed, they changed Winnie the Pooh. It's oh, so scary, but man. this was, this was, this was a little bit scary. I was, I was home by myself. And the dogs even left the room. They didn't even want to watch it. So the I, ghosts so I knew, leave too during the I'm film? telling you, listen, man, listen. I, I, I love my house. This is, it was, it's like 1935 house. Yeah. Okay. I think it's haunted. It's haunted. But I got good ghosts, though. They don't mess with me. They right. just like, you know, they nice. They nice. I ain't got the no bad ghosts where somebody coming in there and slapping <laughs> things out your hand. And I don't got those kind of ghosts. But my, you know what? They always say dogs can see certain yeah. things that humans can't. So, like, every so often, Kobe, my, my, little, my little pocket bully, yeah. will just be growling at the staircase. And I'll be, like, looking up like, who's he growling at? <laughs> and I start thinking about dogs can see things that we can't. I'm like, what if there's someone there? Yeah. That's pretty creepy. Very creepy. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty creepy. My son always says he hears noises in the house when he's over, when he's at the house when he's, you know, there he's always hearing like somebody walking upstairs and he's like, yeah. I so that'd be a new film, The King's Exorcist. Hey, listen. Hey, listen. Yeah, hey, man. Hey. <laughs> it's I, I'm just gonna say right now, I got good, I got good, good vibes there, good spirits yeah. in my household. Don't listen to them spirits if you if you follow me here, I'm with you, baby. All right. I don't want you. Don't, don't give me no bad, bad karma. Them, you know, throw me out. Get out. What? <laughs> I'm gone. Out. I'm out. See, you ain't gotta tell me twice. <laughs> It's the uh, it's the end of an era in network television. The ten year run for the blacklist comes to a close the, later this month. James Spader playing Red Reddington. It's the only show I watch on network TV because normally, you know, they, with all the restrictions and stuff, they're not that interesting. But he's been a fantastic a character show. throughout the ten years. It's been a lot of fun watching that, and that's going to come to a close on NBC. This really? Month. Yeah, ten years. I wonder if he's got syndication rights. Did he get the pay? I'm sure he's made he a does. lot of money on that you show. Over he, years. He's a great actor. Yeah, he's a great. actor. He always plays a great bad guy. Even really. a bad guy in Marvel, right? Oh yeah, he was yeah. The, he was the computerized the AI yeah. guy. Right, right. He's also in a movie, um, uh, uh, something like the 1980s. Like it's um, long blonde hair. It's like, yeah, he, he looked was, like a complete. Yeah, he was, it was like those. he was a, he was a <laughs> yeah. hitman. He was a hitman in a movie, and it was uh, Danny Aiello and. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, oh my God! And it was like uh, Shireen, what's her name? Sharon Theory, whatever her name. Sharon Theory. Charlize Theron. Charlize, yeah, yeah, whatever her name is. You know what I'm talking about? The hot one. Mm -hmm. uh, Atomic. I don't Blonde. forget that. Atomic Blonde. Who, but yeah, he's in that movie. Awesome movie. Yeah, they had he's a great a lot little of great ensembles. Stuff. He was in. Uh, he was in. Uh, what's it with uh, Robert Downey Jr. in the drug movie? Um, Less than zero. Less than zero. Yeah. Man, Andrew you McCarthy. got all these titles. You, yeah. You're good at this. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a Jeopardy kind he's, of guy. Yeah, you know, yeah. he's, he's Rain Man. <laughs> uh, Wapner 430. Wapner 430. <laughs> That's right. He doesn't there say you much. Go, Rain Man. He doesn't say much. He's like, hey, Wapner, as soon as you start talking movie, he start talking like Rain Man. <laughs> of course, I'm not wearing any underpants. <laughs> oh, oh, too much too information. Much. <laughs> too much. You always got to go a little bit too far. Oh, you know? Right, That's why everybody laughing and then you. Hey, that's just wow. Wapner, Wapner, 430, Wapner, 430. <laughs> so you, and, and you'd recommend the Bill Burr show. You said you saw him live in Vegas. Yeah, is he coming this way? Or, no? uh, he is, but uh, yeah, I don't know if I'll see him again. But that was great. I mean, I yeah. highly recommend it. I was, my face hurt for a whole day after that. And I it even his warm up act. <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> no, he's, he's, definitely, Bill Burr. he's definitely worth it. He, he, he absolutely destroys yeah, he's yeah, great. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a good. true master. Whispers. And he will say absolutely anything. He doesn't care who's in the audience, who's oh, going to no. offend. He offended everybody. It's an amazing show. And then hecklers, he just, just yeah, roasted oh, them alive. Them, I yeah. mean, just, Was there hecklers in his show? Oh, of course. Yeah, he just destroyed them. 
Wow. But uh, I can't say what he said. But uh, yeah, Tim had little, front row seats. Yeah, it's nice. a good chance. I got him on Ticketmaster. I couldn't believe I'm at wow. the pool. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. The right on Ticketmaster. And they, they had been sold out for months. And I lucked out. Wow. So, Stacey, is Mike back yet? No. No? No, I drove myself again today. Oh, oh man. man. Well, it hurts. Safety is the most imperative. <laughs> <laughs> Tell the folks how they can get the uh, ride to their next big event. Let's talk about this. Okay, I'm going to talk. If you, yeah. you, know, if you hey. reach, hey, listen, if you reach over again, I'm going to throw a punch you, okay? That was coming up next, okay? All right. You, we got an element to the show, okay, yeah. buddy? Oh, my God. <laughs> Windy City Limits only provides championship service. Making a reservation is so easy, it's a slam dunk. Let Windy City break the full court pressure of traffic to get your destination in style and on time. Contact us at 847-916-9300. Oh, man. That's 847-916-9300. Go to WindyCityLimos.com. And, Mike, if you're out there listening to me somewhere in Ireland chasing leprechauns and Conor McGregor, you need to get your butt home. You've been gone too long, buddy. Right. Put down the proper been, 12. Hey, yeah, whatever. It's been gone for about two weeks now, Mike. It's time to come on back to work, baby. And oh, you got a special shout out, Stace. Listen, to all my little fans that, you know, get on in and they read, they send us things. This this really melts my heart. This is just the little guys. I love the kids. OK, so I'm going to show you. all I don't know if y'all can see it. Y'all see, there it is right there. See this little letter? See this little no, letter? No, it's nice. See, it's a little drawing of me. Okay, this comes from Delaney Anderson. Nice. She says, Dear Stacy King, I want a Stacy King fathead with a dry erase. <laughs> and a can she of goes, 45. <laughs> <laughs> this is a child, Mark. Oh, Come sorry. on. Sorry. She's like, with a dry erase uh, a speech uh, uh, board or something. I, I can't really say. Then she draws my little, my little face in a little suit. Nice. She says, bang, bang, bang. And then... Uh, and uh, something else. Uh, oh, he uh, got fouled. Oh, yeah. Well, he got fouled. He got fouled. Oh, well, I don't really say that. But hey, you know what? It's, <laughs> Delaney, it's the thought that counts. Yes, we appreciate and we, that. Did we send her a bottle? That's her, right. Yeah, you, I took your note and then put a okay, bottle so, with it. Okay, so uh, the, the hot sauce packer, Delaney, we sent you a bottle of hot sauce. It nice. might be too hot for you because, you know, you're probably about five years old. So <laughs> give it to your mom and dad. They'll enjoy it. And they'll enjoy it. Thank you for this. We're, we're going to do that periodically. You send some stuff and we might read it on the air. Thank you very much, Delaney. Yeah, we appreciate that, and we appreciate everybody watching and listening. Hope you enjoyed the interview with Phil Jackson. We only bring you the best guests here. Before we get out of here, we have one more shout-out. Our good friend Pete, the sign god. It's his daughter's birthday, so happy birthday to her as well. So, Oh, one more shout-out. All right. Shout-out to my boy, Mark Harper. He's retired. That's right, yeah, retiring, Mark, yeah. He's retiring from everything. Good man. Mark Harper is one of the best in the business as far as get, taking care of audio, mm -hmm. visual, every, I mean, he. anytime I've had a problem with my headset. And he's always calm. He's too. always, he just walks out yeah. there, Mark, and he's just like, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, my telestrator is not working. I got, I got you. Yeah. I got you. So yeah. he'll, I mean, he's been in the middle of a game in the first quarter and I'm talking do 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 and I'm trying, I can't look at my monitor because he's working on it. Yeah. But he gets it done in two, like no, he's know, the 20 best. seconds yeah. and he will be sorely missed. So I hope, I hope whoever that, you know, they bring in is half as good as Mark. Cause I'm telling you, man, I, I was trying to, I tried to get his wife to let him go a few more years, right. but you know, it's, no, it's, he, he's, he's earned it, man. He's, he's been, you know, he's been working for NBC for the longest. He was a sports channel. He's been all the, I mean, he's been everywhere. So congratulations, Mark. Yeah. Best of luck in retirement. And, uh, yeah. Best Enjoy of luck, yourself. buddy. I want to thank the Sriracha crew for their hard work today, doing some great job. Good Matt, job, guys. Maddie's back. She's hanging in there, not feeling <laughs> great, but she made it through we the whole show. It, we found out it wasn't Mono America. It was a drunk woman. Oh, <laughs> so no. She was Cold drunk 45. for it. Was there any 45, 45 there? Oh, man. <laughs> Billy no, D. Williams goes no, out no, smooth. No, <laughs> I'll try. I'll yeah, oh, my. It's got to be 5 o'clock somewhere, America. Somewhere. So reach into the refrigerator, reach way in the back, and see if you can find yourself a can of cold 45 and start the party. Yum, yum. Oh, my gosh. And Stacey's got a message for you on the way out. Drive home safely and don't drink don't cold drink 45 and drive. while you're driving. <laughs> beep, beep. Did you not get the memo?